Hey everyone, it's Anthony from Pretty Printed here. In this video, I'm going to go over how HTTP requests work on the web. So this is the intro video to my Learn Python Requests course, which you can check out in the link in the description below. But this covers requests in general, so it's not really Python specific. So if you are ever curious about how requests work, then this is the video for you. So I hope you enjoy. Thanks for watching. So before I get into actually showing you how to use the Python library and how to call other APIs, what I'm going to talk about first is requests in general. So these slides are going to be in the context of accessing APIs and not regular web pages. So there are a lot of similarities between the two, but for our purposes in these slides and in the course in general, we're going to be talking about accessing APIs with requests. So with these slides, I'm going to keep it pretty simple. I'm not going to get too technical about it. It's just a really basic overview of how requests work on the web. But if you have any more technical questions, then feel free to ask me in the comments below the video. So what is a request? A request is a way to exchange data between a client and a server. So you can think of the client as being the thing that initiates the request. So the client sends the request and then the server responds to the request. So this relationship is very important. Oftentimes when you're using requests, well, not oftentimes, but every time, you're going to be the client. But if you were creating your own API, then in that case, you would be the server. So the client sends the request and the server responds to that request. Each request is sent to a specific URL, meaning www.example.com slash endpoint slash page, whatever. You're familiar with URLs because you use the web. You wouldn't be watching this course if you weren't familiar with the web. But just like you type in URLs to your browser, APIs are sent to URLs as well. And then the message returned by the server is called the response. So every time you send a request, you're going to get a response accompanying that requests. So it's always after you send the request, the server is going to take in that request, process it in some way, and then send you a response back. So one of the main things that we use requests for is really data exchange. So data from the client into the server, and then the server can take some data and send it back to the client. So some forms of data are URL parameters, so this is in the case of sending only. So if you were to send a request to the URL example.com slash API question mark data equals value, then the data in this particular case that you're passing is value. And you've probably seen this before, and that's because you can send extra data in the URL that is beyond the actual URL itself. So in this case, the URL is example.com slash API, and then you can start appending on data as you wish. And of course, it depends on how the server is set up. You wouldn't just send random data, of course. You would send the data that the server expects, but this is one of the formats that a server could expect from you. You can also send form data. So we typically think of form data as being some visual form that you type into and then you hit send and that will send the form data over to the server. Well, you don't have to have a visual display of a form to send form data. You can send form data by just really telling the server that the data that you're passing in is form data. So I won't get into the technical details of what a request looks like, but just know that basically you have to tell the server what kind of data you're sending so it knows what it's going to be reading. Another form of data is JSON data. So I have an example JSON object here, just data and value. And JSON is nice because it is easy for humans to read and it's easy for machines to process. So it's not the best format at either one of those, but when you take the combination of the two, it works pretty well. So it's not the best way to display information for people and it's not the best way for a machine, a computer to read in data, but when you take the combination of the two, it works pretty well, and that's one of the reasons why it's so popular. And it's also very simple. So 
I don't even have to explain the JSON specification to you. If you are familiar with dictionaries in Python and lists in Python, then you should know everything you need to know about JSON objects. It's really just a combination of those two. Uh, it's based off JavaScript. So in JavaScript terminology, it is arrays and the JavaScript equivalent of a dictionary, which is an object. Then you can send files and you can receive files. So in the case of JSON, you can send or receive JSON. Files, you can send and receive files as well. So you can send a picture, you can receive a picture. You can send a zip file, you can receive a zip file. Any combination that you want, it just depends on the particular use case that you are looking for with that particular API and that URL. But know that files are something that can be sent. But like I said before, you have to tell the server what kind of file that you're sending. Otherwise, it probably wouldn't be able to determine what file it is. In some cases, it can. But in all these cases, you're going to send along with the data the type of data that it is. And then XML. So XML is similar to JSON in a sense that it is easy for humans to read and easy for machines to process. But it's not the best at either one. Like there's obviously a compromise when you combine the two. So XML is just something that looks kind of like HTML. HTML is actually like a form of XML. But XML isn't as, as popular as it used to be. JSON has pretty much taken over for structured data that needs to be sent. But you may see XML when you are sending requests to some particular API. So now the components of a request. So the first thing is you are sending a request to your URL, but you are using a method on that URL. So for example, when you're using a browser and you type in a URL, you are always performing a get request. And these requests don't have any hard constraints on them. They're just conventions. So by convention, get means give me some data. Post means I'm sending you some data. Those are the two most popular ones. And then you have others like delete, which means delete some data on the server for me. And then you have something like put, which means update some information on the server. You can make it to where delete actually gives you information and post delete something and get updates information. You can do that if you want, but it'd just be a little more confusing because that goes against the convention. So the verbs here, the methods, get, post, delete, and the other ones, are just a conventional way to kind of tell the server what you want to do. But ultimately, this is specified by the server itself. So just look out for that when you're reading the documentation for whatever API that you're using. Also, the data is a component of the request, and it's probably the most important component of the request because chances are you're going to be sending some data. Uh, in the case of a GET request, you may not have to send any data. Sometimes you'll send data in the URL parameters, but Data is pretty important for a request if you have to send data. And then we have headers. So headers you can think of as a way to send all the um, additional information about the request, kind of like the meta information about the request or just extra information that is beyond the data for the request. So the headers will be specified by you when you're sending the request requests. There are some that are done automatically for you, but some things that you can send in a header, for example, are the type of data that you are sending to the server, um, where you're sending from, and just many other things that are kind of related to the request, but they aren't really the important part of the request. However, something in the header can be pretty important depending on the API that you're sending to. And then there's also authentication. So authentication doesn't have its own component by itself per se. Instead, you're sending authentication usually through the data or through the headers. So in the case of an API, oftentimes you'll send a token and this token would be used to authenticate whoever you are. So the server knows that you're allowed to access this API and that token would just go into a header. Or you can just pass the token in a piece of the data as well, and then the server will read that data looking for that token to verify you are who you say you are. So it can be in either one. Now let's talk about the response components. So of course, data is going to be returned by the server. So if you are requesting a file, then the data will be 
that file. If you are requesting a JSON object in return, then you'll get a JSON object and so on. So a lot of server responses are going to have data company with them. They don't always have to, but it's typical to have data return in a response. So for instance, if you're sending a request in your browser, the data return is the actual web page. And then we have a status code. So the status code gives you information about the status of the response. So sometimes the response works correctly. Sometimes there's an error. Uh, sometimes it redirects you somewhere. And that is something you need to know. And we have status codes, which I'm going to show you on the next slide on the web to tell you easily the information you need to know about what happened with the request. And then finally, headers. So just like you can send headers in a request, oftentimes you'll get headers in the response. And one popular one is the type of data that was sent by the server. So the server will tell you, hey, this is JSON. So then you know when you're reading the data, you interpret it as JSON. You wouldn't want to get JSON data back and try to read it as XML. It just wouldn't work. So the server is telling you what the data is. And you can also have other types of things in the headers as well. Okay, so I'll start briefly about status codes. There are many different status codes, but the number that they start with is the important one. So first, a 100 status code. So one something is just an informational status code. It's just telling you like, hey, here's what I want you to know. They're not very common, but you may run into them. Second is success, and this is probably the most common one. Basically, it means everything worked correctly. If you see a 200 status code, then you know things worked out well. Um, sometimes an API will give you a 200 status code and then give you an error message in the data. Uh, but that 200 code means in that case that the actual request response worked, but what you did in the request doesn't quite work. And then you have 300s, which means redirect. So sometimes you are going to request a certain URL, and instead of returning data back on that same URL, it will send you somewhere else, and then it will perform another request automatically for you. So these aren't that popular with APIs, but if you were dealing with uh, websites in general, then you would run into a lot of 300 status codes. And then we have 400 status codes. So 400 means that there's a client error. So probably the most popular one is 404. 404 means not found. So if you try to send a request to a URL that doesn't exist, then in return, you're going to get a 404 error. There are other types of 400 errors as well, 400, uh, 410. There are so many of them, but just know that it means that you, the client, messed up in some way. It's not the server's fault. And when it is the server's fault, we have 500 errors. So 500 errors are basically telling you that, hey, something went wrong on the server. Um, you probably have to try again later. Maybe the server admin will be alerted to fix whatever error. But just know that a server error is something that you really can't fix. You have to wait for the server to fix it itself. So you'll have to try a different uh, request or sometimes you have to send different data because they didn't design the server to be robust so some data can break the server so it's just something that you experiment with when you are working with requests and now just a couple of tips when sending requests know that requests are blocking so what that means in a typical sense in python is when you send a request your program is going to wait until that request gets a response before continuing with the rest of the code. And the reason why this is important is if a request takes a very long time, then whoever is using your app is going to have to wait for that request. So you have to keep that in mind when designing your app. So if you have a web app, for instance, and the user fills out a form and hits enter, and then on your server, you send a request somewhere, if you have to wait for that request to come back before sending a, a response to your particular client, then they may not stick around long enough to see it. They may think something is wrong. So if you're sending a request, it's always a good idea to get them outside of your user's flow so they don't have to wait on these requests to return. So it's just a way of designing the program. If 
it's a really basic request or it's really important and the user can't continue without this response, then yeah, it was going to be blocking. But in most cases, you wanna kind of separate them when you are writing your code. And the second is requests can be generic. So by this, I mean a lot of APIs do the same thing. So let's say you wanted to get the weather in your hometown. There will probably be many APIs that can do this for you. So what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna couple your program too closely to one API. Uh, instead, what you wanna do is you want to create like a function that can send a request for you and then with the response, it converts the response to like a standard format that's used in the rest of your app. That way, if something happens with the API that you're using, you can easily switch it out and use a different one without having to change a lot of your code. You're only changing that one function. If you weren't using a function like that, what would happen is if you had to switch out the API, then you'd have to rewrite a lot of code in your app and it can be a little annoying. So just keep those two things in mind when you're writing requests. When you're first starting off, they're not really too important, but as your app grows, these two things become really important. So now I've covered the basics of requests on the web. So now what I'm going to do in the next section is actually show you how to use the Python request library. And then after that, I'll show you some examples of calling some actual APIs.